Hello everyone. So today I'd like to talk about multiple testing or statistical inference when we're asking thousands of questions at the same time. Everything I'll talk about has been implemented in the multiple testing package, which is joined with, but actually most of the work has been done by Julian Gehring. Before we can talk about multiple testing, we will have to revisit classical statistics and single hypothesis testing. So here's how science often proceeds. Oh, yeah, sorry. So here's how science often proceeds. A scientist might want to prove that a drug is better than a placebo for curing a disease. So the initial stance will be that to assume a null hypothesis, basically that the drug is no better or, than, or worse than a placebo. And then the scientist will gather data and try to use this data to disprove this null hypothesis. Now the statistical device in order to disprove the null hypothesis is hypothesis testing. And usually the statistic used is the so-called p-value. The p-value is a random variable and low values of it indicate evid evidence against the null hypothesis. And traditionally, it might get, the null hypothesis might get rejected if the p-value is less than 0 0.05. So the key property of uh, p-value is that under the null hypothesis, so when it's actually true, um, it's uniformly distributed. So here I'm doing a thought experiment where the drug is actually not better than the placebo and the experiment can be repeated 10,000 times and we get 10,000 p-values and these have been plotted in this histogram. And you see that to the left of the black line, which marks the point uh, zero 0.05 uh, um, point, there's around 500 p-values that fell below this line, uh, even though there was nothing going on. And that's kind of the statistical risk we're willing to take. So what's different with modern statistics? We now are not testing only one drug. We're testing whole compound libraries at the same time. Or in the running example here, we might test different SNPs, so genetic mutations associated with body mass index. So we're really doing two and a half million hypotheses at the same time. Below I've plotted a histogram of these p-values. And what I'd like you to notice is that towards the right, we have again this uniform distribution. These are mainly null p-values, which we're not interested in. But to the left, you can see the strong peak around zero. And these are the alternatives, the signals, so the SNPs we really want to discover. So now you might ask, what's so different compared to the single hypothesis testing setting? Why can't we just reject all of the ones that landed below 0 0.05? And this very classic XKCD comic illustrates it. So here scientists are interested in whether jelly beans cause acne. They gather data, they run their experiment, the p-value is up above uh, 0 0.05, so they can't publish anything. Then they try different colors. They try purple, brown, um, pink, red, etc., and they keep getting p-values above 0 0.05. But eventually they get one p-value that's below 0 0.05 for the green jelly beans, and then this gets published. Of course, based on the histogram I showed before, we knew that this would happen. Of course, some p-value would eventually, just by chance, with that nothing going on, uh, be smaller than 0 0.05. So that's the main question uh, multiple testing asks. How can we confidently discover something despite this multiplicity? And actually already a hundred years ago, a very simple method was proposed to deal with that. So here we have two and a half million tests. So we would multiply each p-value by two and a half millions, get the so-called adjusted p-value, and compare this again, 0 0.05. And this would help us protect ourselves against false discoveries. But as you can imagine, now the threshold is way too low. It's too hard to discover anything. So people really have proposed lots of different statistical methods which have the same paradigm. They start with a vector of p-values and then adjust them in order to correct for this multiplicity. And all of these methods come with different statistical guarantees and different assumptions. And many of them have a lot more, lead to a lot higher power than Bonferroni and have been implemented in this package. Another question we might ask is not which specific ones are we quite confident are alternatives, but we might be interested in how many of them are actually alternatives. Or equivalently, we can ask, what is the pro proportion of null hypothesis? And again, there's many methods have, that have been proposed in the literature that take a vector of p-values and then estimate this proportion. And actually, these two questions are not so unrelated. So there have 
answering, being able to answer one question helps us in answering the other question. For example, the benjamini hochberg adaptive method takes an arbitrary estimator of the proportion of nulls and then adjusts the p-values. And we can really easily express this kind of composition using the type system. Again, most of the things I talked about where we start with a vector of p-values and adjust them is very classical. So the problem with this approach is that it doesn't de account for heterogeneity, that not all hy hypotheses are a priori the same. For example, in the GWAS example I showed before, this was actually the result of a meta-analysis. So for each SNP, for each genetic mutation, we had a different sample size. And to illustrate this heterogeneity, I split the data set, the p-values, into two groups based on the sample size that was available for testing. So on the left, you see a histogram of the 50% of the smallest p-values and to the right of the largest ones. And to the left, you basically see a uniform histogram. There's basically nothing to detect. And again, from basic statistical theory, we know that if the sample size is too low, we won't have power to detect anything. On the other hand, on the right, we see this very strong peak to the left. So here we have re really a lot of power to detect things. So in our multiple testing problem, we are penalizing ourselves too much by looking at the p-values on the left. So how can we account for this? And there's a very general procedure of dealing with this, which is to assign weights. And here I want to talk about some really great work that happened in StatSpace, which introduced the abstract weights type, recognizing that statisticians use weights, often with very different semantics and for lots of different methods. And now you can basically subtype abstract weights. And for multiple testing, the appropriate type is these priority weights. And the different multiple testing methods I showed all have to be modified in different ways to accommodate for weights. And again, multiple dispatch makes this very easy to do. Another question we might ask is how can we actually learn the weights from the data? So before I showed a histogram where I did a binary split, but of course we'd like to think of the sample size as a continuous a predictor in a sense. And recently, Simina Boca and Jeff Leek published a paper where they basically think of this whole thing as a regression framework. And if they can describe this as a regression framework in their paper, of course we can also explain it or have it in Julia be dependent uh, in this form of a regression framework. So we introduce this Boca leak type, which is parameterized by a regression model as defined in stats base. So now we can use whatever regression model has been defined that basically has the fit and predict method and get some weights as a function of our covariates. Here, for example, I fit a linear model from the GLM package, and you can see this linear trend. So here, basically, um, the larger the sample size, the larger weight was assigned, and you will see this linear fit since we use a linear model, and the truncation at zero happened because weights can't be negative. But for another example of another uh, regression method, here I used isotonic regression. This basically finds the best least squares fit subject to a monotonicity constraint. And so it's a fully non-parametric method up to this monotonicity assumption. And again, you can see the fit. And um, again, higher sample sizes get higher weight. But in principle, because of Julia's gray type system, you could use whatever non-parametric regression method you'd like to use, either trend, trend filtering or smoothing splines or Gaussian processes, etc. So basically, I hope I have convinced you that multiple testing is a really important area of statistics and very important for reproducibility in science. And here we have efficient implementations of common and new algorithms for multiple testing and a unified interface. And I really find that lots of statistical ideas can be really easily expressed with Julia's type system. And especially when procedures are made up from smaller building blocks. So I'd really like to thank the Julia community, uh, of course Julia Stats, and all of you for your attention. <laughs>